Hi, good morning, everyone. We are in our last day of conversation UTR, and as all the days, we will be starting with a video about our admission process. So, uh, please, team, can we go to the video? Ciudad Tecnológica El Retoño, queremos prepararte. Contamos con siete carreras bilingües, experiencias internacionales e instalaciones de primer nivel. Además, muchos de nuestros egresados trabajan en las mejores empresas del mundo. Inscríbete en www.utr.edu.mx. Contigo al 100. Gobierno del Estado. Hi, good morning, everyone. Again, UTR community, external viewers who are joining us. Welcome to the final live broadcast of Conversations at UTR. Thank you, you all, for your weekly participation and a special thanks to all of our speakers. Without you, it couldn't be possible to carry out this project. Today, uh, we are going to close with Gold Clasp with a webinar named US-Mexico Cooperation on COVID-19 and Moving Forward. With the presence of the Ambassador of the United States in Mexico, in Mexico, Christopher Landau. We also welcome the General Consul in Guadalajara, Mrs. Robin Matthewman, the Consul for Press and Culture, Mr. Sandy Paul, and Mr. Marco Gonzalez, Press Specialist. Welcome to the Conversations UTR. We are glad to have you here. Uh, in the past Conversations UTR, at UTR sessions, we have learned that international and bilateral cooperation is key not only to overcome what is happening in the world today, like with the COVID-19, but also to have a window of opportunities, development and mutual corporations. Many of the problems that nations face today do not know about borders. That is the case of Mexico and United States, despite the fact that both have different, opi different opinions on some issues, these dot this does not accept them from working together to find best solution to us or to them. Uh, today we have the presence of someone who is highly attracted to the culture and history of Mexico and is currently working to have a better relationship between these two countries. It's a great honor to, ha to have accepted this invitation, Ambassador Christopher Landau, who will deliver the conference today. And let me talk to you about uh, um, the professional uh, life of the ambassador. Ambassador Lando was born in Madrid, Spain, and attended the American School in the Asunción, Paraguay, which is why he speaks Spanish fluently. He has a Bachelor in Arts and History from Harvard College, and during his academic career, he was awarded with some prizes, such as the Sofia Front Pi. Sophia Front Prize for the best average and the Hoops Prize for his thesis entitled The Relationship of the United States with the Leftist Government of Venezuela. He also received his Juris Doctor degree from Harvard Law School when he has co-chair of the Harvard Law Review. He was named, he was named United States Ambassador to Mexico on August 12th, the last year, 2019. And as ambassador, he has a great respect of Mexico, its culture, history, and national sovereignty. His vision of the Mexico and United States relationship, it's as a partner nations, where both can progress and advance with the other, mainly issues in security, immigration, and trade. Ambassador, welcome to UTR. UTR is your house. So uh, we have, uh, we have, uh, we are honored to have you here. Thank you very much for the acceptance. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much, Mr. Rector. Thank you for inviting me to join you and the UTR community today. Uh, es posible que yo hable en español y también en inglés porque ustedes son una universidad bilingüe. Así que uh, creo que esto uh, será un gran evento para todos nosotros que somos bilingües. Uh, y en primer lugar, uh, déjeme dar también la bienvenida a, a todos y a todas uh, los estudiantes de la universidad. Es para mí un gran placer uh, poder compartir unos momentos uh, con ustedes aquí el día de hoy. Uh, como muy bien lo dijo el rector, 
yo uh, llegué a México como embajador de Estados Unidos hace casi un año, en agosto del año pasado. Y uh, realmente para mí ha sido un enorme placer personal y un, un enorme honor profesional, porque yo sí creo de todo corazón que como países vecinos no tenemos otra alternativa que uh, llevarnos bien pues y, y profundizar las relaciones. Por supuesto que, que hay retos, uh, pero desde mi punto de vista son todos retos compartidos. Uh, por ejemplo, en, en el tema de la seguridad, uh, creo que hay, 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 hay mucho que podemos hacer y realmente tenemos que cooperar, porque creo que ninguno de nuestros países puede resolver solo uh, estos, uh, los problemas que, que tenemos. Pero también no, no, no me quiero enfocar uh, sobre solamente problemas, porque creo que eh, ahora estamos a, a una semana de la entrada en vigor del, del nuevo tratado TEMEC y uh, eso va a crear muchas oportunidades para mayor integración económica entre nuestros países. Y para mí, esa integración uh, abre la puerta a, a una integración mayor en, en todas las áreas de la sociedad, en áreas culturales, educativos. Uh, yo, yo lo he visto con mis propios ojos a través de los últimos 30 años, desde sé que firmó el, el, uh, el Tratado de Libre Comercio, es increíble cómo han aumentado no solamente los contactos económicos entre nuestros países, pero también los contactos uh, a todo nivel, uh, familiares, culturales, uh, sociales. Y, y me parece eso muy positivo para nuestras relaciones. Yo, yo, yo soy optimista uh, para el, eh, la, la, la trayectoria de, de la relación. Um, en primer lugar, pero, pero déjenme un poco hablar. Uh, les quiero felicitar en primer lugar por el carácter binacional de, de, de la UTR. Me parece muy importante que tengamos educaciones uh, educativas que, 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 que enseñan en, en ambos idiomas, porque me parece que uh, justamente, uh, precisamente porque... Eh, se están integrando más todos los días nuestras economías. Es importante tener uh, profesionales en ambos países que entienden uh, la, 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 la cultura, la, 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 la historia, pero sobre todo la lengua del otro país, porque sin hablar el mismo idioma eh, eh, es casi imposible la comunicación. Así que uh, le, le, les felicito. Para mí, ser bilingüe ha sido uno de, las, de, de los grandes orgullos de mi vida. Y yo estoy seguro que no estaría en este puesto si no fuera por, por ese gran don uh, que me dieron mis padres. Uh, y tengo la suerte de que mi papá también fue diplomático. Así es que yo nací en Madrid. Y como muy, muy bien lo dijo el rector, uh, cuando yo tenía ocho años, uh, nos mudamos a Asunción del Paraguay. Ahí estudié en un colegio bilingüe durante cinco años. Uh, básicamente, la, la, los, los últimos años de la primaria y, y los años del middle school, or, no, no sé cómo se dice, pero los años ahí de, de, de intermediarios. Y después volví a Estados Unidos a, a terminar mis estudios en la prepa y la universidad, pero siempre... Uh, tomando cursos en español, uh, literatura hispanoamericana, uh, historia latinoamericana y uh, pues uh, eso ha quedado siempre conmigo. Y aunque yo soy abogado, como creo que lo es usted, señor rector, uh, yo, yo uh, siempre he, he mantenido... Uh, mi, mi español, no, 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 no lo usé mucho durante mis años de abogado en Washington, pero es una parte muy importante de mí. Y uh, pues uh, cuando uh, el, el año pasado uh, este puesto uh, quedó abierto, uh, y yo, yo, yo le comenté al presidente que yo realmente quería ser embajador en México porque me parece uh, 
uno de los puestos más importantes de nuestro gobierno, porque desde mi punto de vista es la, la relación internacional más importante que tenemos en Estados Unidos y que ustedes tienen en México. Compartimos una frontera, uh, compartimos uh, la, la, nuestras uh, economías, uh, nuestra gente. Hay, hay uh, más o menos 35 millones de estadounidenses de descendencia mexicana. Y uh, es, eh, ha sido un cambio uh, demográfico muy importante en, en mi país. Uh, y, pero es, es, es la nueva realidad. Y, y, y para mí es muy importante uh, tener buenas relaciones entre nuestros países. Yo, yo no creo que ninguno de nuestros países pueda tener realmente prosperidad o seguridad si el otro no lo tiene. Así que uh, me, me encuentro muy, muy, muy contento de, de, de estar aquí y les quiero felicitar a ustedes por todo, todos sus lazos que tienen con, con nuestra embajada, uh, con nuestro consulado general en Guadalajara. Uh, ahí está la, la señora cónsul, que es muy amiga mía. Y, y tenemos un gran equipo allá. Uh, y para nosotros es muy importante tener... Todos estos, uh, eh, to, to, todos estos, todas esas relaciones, eh, lo voy a decir en inglés porque no sé exactamente cómo decirlo en español, pero, eh, you know, it, I think it's very valuable for both countries that our relationships are not just handled by a few people in the government on both sides, uh, that, that the real strength of our relationship is all the connective tissue we have between our countries, and that's, you know, business people, people in universities, uh, people who have family on both sides of the border. I mean, that's ultimately, I think, the real strength of the relationship because presidents will come and go, ambassadors will come and go. But I think it's these kind of ties that well, I think will always keep the, you know, the relations strong between our countries at, at a very human level regardless of what happens, you know, at the government level. And I think it's a very healthy thing that there are so many uh, interconnections in the relationships between the United States and Mexico. Uh, and, and I think you are part of that at UTR. So I, I want to give you a big, uh, you know, shout out and, and acknowledgement uh, for the role you play. Let me just talk a little bit about the, you know, what has happened in the relationship between the United States and Mexico while I've been ambassador here. Uh, when I arrived last fall, uh, I think as, as the rector said, I, I made it very clear that I had three priorities as ambassador, migration, security, and economics. Uh, because there's so much on the table between the United States and Mexico. I mean, we have you know, things that happen to American citizens here. This is the country with the most Americans who live here and who visit here more than any other country in the world outside our own country. And the same is true in Mexico. There's more Mexicans in the United States than, than in any other country. And so, you know, there, there can be very tricky consular issues. There can be tricky border issues, particularly with water allocation, that's always very difficult. But I said, look, to be successful, I have to focus my energy on setting certain goals in certain areas. I can't, I can't do everything because then, you, you know, you, you, you can never really get control of your agenda. And so I, I focused on these three issues. And I think we have been, uh, you know, quite successful. You know, when I, when, I, when I arrived last year, the real crisis on migration was migration of people from third countries, uh, mostly from the northern countries of Central America, Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador, who wanted to come to the United States, but were crossing Mexico without any documents in order to enter our country without any documents. And... That crisis had gotten very bad last year. In, in the spring of last year, there were 140,000 people detained at our southern border in just one month. So imagine that's a pace of almost a million and a half people uh, coming into our country illegally 
uh, if you take that on a yearly basis. And we said, look, we can't handle this anymore. Uh, you know, we, we don't have the resources to process these people, to detain these people. So, you know, we, 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 we worked, uh, you know, very closely with the Mexican government to come up with a solution. And I think it's very important for Mexico to realize that, you know, with communication and transportation having gotten much more advanced, this is really a challenge for Mexico too, to have people coming from all over the world with no controls. Uh, you know, I mean, this is not just people from Central America. You also get people from Congo and Bangladesh and Kazakhstan and, you know, uh, Bolivia, Venezuela. I mean, it's, it's all over the world. And I think if Mexico says, you know, that, that I mean, I think as neighbors, we have to realize that this is a shared challenge. It's not just for the United States, but I think Mexico also has a role because these people are coming through Mexico to the United States. And I hope there is a greater understanding in Mexico that Mexico can't just say, that's not our problem. I mean, that's not being a good neighbor to say, you know, yes, people, we're letting all these people come in and go up to your border and then it's not our problem. Said, look, it's, a, it's another reto compartido. And, you know, I think we had some very good discussions with, with the Mexican government last year and we, we've, we've been working very well together now and, and those numbers have gone down substantially. I'm talking, I'm not even getting to COVID yet. I'm saying even before COVID, the numbers had, had come down. Um, you know, on, on security, you know, the, the drugs, uh, you know, we look at the security issue primarily from our perspective as a narcotics issue. We, we have a lot of drugs being used in our country that come from Mexico. You know, I, I think um, traditionally uh, there's been a lot of finger pointing between the United States and Mexico where Americans say to Mexico, stop sending us these drugs. And the Mexicans come back and saying, stop, you know, creating a demand for these drugs and stop sending us arms and illegal money. And, you know, my attitude is, you know, basta uh, with all these accusations back and forth. It's a common problem. I mean, it's not good for Mexico to uh, have these carteles that are so powerful and, um, you know, I think really threaten the sovereignty of Mexico. Uh, as well as the security of Mexico. And so, you know, we have been, I think, working well together over the past year. It's a big challenge. And again, I always say it's a, it's a shared challenge because I recognize that, you know, American drug consumption is a big part of the problem. But I also think it's important to recognize that people who are either making drugs in Mexico, some of, you know, the, 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 Amapolas and uh, and now the the fentanyl and some of the synthetic opioids. These are very very dangerous drugs, and I think both countries have to realize that that you know we're in this together. And um, you know I'm I, I'm looking forward to deepening cooperation in that regard. Finally, let me just say on the economic front, uh, you know the big push last year during my first few months as ambassador was to get the Temec approved by all the countries. And, you know, that's never an easy task. It requires difficult negotiations. Uh, but I think it is pretty amazing that we have presidents in both countries, uh, President Trump and President Lopez Obrador, who are longtime skeptics of the Tratado de Libre Comercio, you know, what we call NAFTA from uh, 25 years ago, uh, but they both came around and found a, a uh, you know, new version that they could not only accept, but, but were actually very enthusiastic about. And I think it was very important that in, in all three countries, the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, the approval by the legislature this time was very overwhelming. In the United States, it was about 90% in favor and only 10% against. So, you know, I think, I think a lot of people have realized now how important that economic relationship is and how it really benefits both of our countries if it is handled 
fairly. Uh, you know, we want free trade, but it has to be fair trade that doesn't, you know, It doesn't take jobs away from the United States, invest and, and, and do business. So, you know, I think things were going along pretty well in terms of my agenda. Um, can you hear me okay? I, I just got to note that my internet connection is unstable. We now yes, hear yes, you. Yes, Ambassador. We lost you for a moment, but uh, it seems to be okay now. Yes, we hear you, Ambassador. Hmm. We, we hear you loud and clear, Ambassador. We just lost you for a few moments. Mm -hmm. I think that he will be reconnecting. Um, Hello? Uh, we, we hear you, Ambassador. Yes. Can you hear us? Maybe if you have the opportunity to, to, to do a cable connection, I don't know if you were using Wi-Fi. Hello? Yeah. Can you yeah. hear me? Ambassador, we hear you. Oh, okay. Well, I can't, um, it looks like my, I'm sorry, it looks like my screen is frozen. So I'll keep talking um, and I apologize. I can't hear anybody else, uh, but, but I will keep talking. In the chat, let me know if, if you stop hearing me, okay? Um, and, and hopefully we, we'll get back. Um, you know, so I was saying, you know, I think things are going along very well. And then all of a sudden this year, um, COVID hits in, in um, mid-March and the whole world changes uh, for me and, and, and I think for all of us. And suddenly, you know, public health issues go to the top of the agenda. You know, interestingly, the first thing we had to address was our common border. And uh, because, you know, you can imagine the amount of people and cars and trucks that cross that border every day. Uh, and it was very important to us, as it was to the Mexican government, to try to keep that border open uh, at least to commerce, uh, because that's very important for the economy of both our countries. And um, the, we, we, we reached an agreement uh, with the Mexican foreign ministry, um, uh, you know, working very late one night to keep the border open for essential services. Uh, you know, in other words, people who work on the other side of the border or the trucks bringing the commerce or people who were studying over the other side of the border or, or medic, had medical needs, but you know, to restrict people from going for non-essential reasons, uh, you know, shopping, going to a restaurant, visiting family. And you know, that agreement actually is still in place and ha has worked out extremely well. Uh, the, you know, we have managed to uh, really reduce the the, 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 the the kind of everyday traffic across the border that can obviously you know bring the virus or spread the virus uh, and uh, so you know I think there's a lot of pressure now to open that uh, the border back up to normal uh, capacity to lift those restrictions 
Uh, and, you know, I'm hoping we can do that, but that all depends on the public health situation uh, there. Uh, you know, the, the area that has been a challenge uh, has been on the economic uh, side during the pandemic because our institutions, I think, have not kept up with our uh, trade. And so, you know, I started getting phone calls uh, almost immediately after Mexico shut down all the, you know, the non-essential industries from companies in the United States saying, well, we've been deemed essential in the United States and we are operating, but uh, we're not getting components from our Mexican suppliers. Uh, and so both our countries uh, you know, unilaterally defined what was an essential industry in our country, but nobody was really thinking about these cross-border supply chains. And so it was a real challenge to uh, you know, work at both the federal and state level to try to uh, salvage these supply chains and make sure that uh, you know, that they wouldn't get permanently broken by, by, by the crisis. I'm happy to report that I don't think there was a single company in the United States that was uh, operating uh, during the pandemic that was forced to close for lack of Mexican parts. I think we were able to, to uh, keep the parts working, obviously understanding that on both sides of the border, there's a very serious health crisis and that it was perfectly legitimate for governments on both sides of the border to impose very stringent sanitary protocols on their workers uh, to prevent people from getting sick and, and even dying. So, you know, that it's a challenge for both countries, uh, you know, the, the economic implications of this. And, you know, we're still in, in good, uh, you know, working good cooperation with the Mexican authorities, but I think we need to have a game plan for how we handle the next crisis because our economies are so interlocked and the supply chains are, there, there's so many supply chains that we need to have a more formal mechanism, I think, to address these kind of problems in the future. Um, let me see what else. I, I um, you know, am, am uh, very excited. It, it looks like President Lopez Obrador may be visiting uh, us in Washington uh, soon in the next few weeks to celebrate the, the new treaty. And I think that would be a very positive sign. I think all of our countries need a positive sign on the economic side after the terrible crisis that the pandemic has created. And so, you know, we are still uh, planning that, but we're very hopeful that will happen in about uh, two weeks in, in early July. So I think that is really what I had to say. Let me just maybe a few final comments on, you know, my role as ambassador. You know, I think that it is uh, very important to um, emphasize, you know, how much I enjoy living in Mexico. I, I, I really love my trips, especially to the interior. Um, uh, I, I had a great, I've not yet been to Aguascalientes, so that's on my list of states. I have uh, visited half of the states, so I, I, uh, I owe you a visit in Aguascalientes, and I very much hope that when the pandemic it, uh, it, you know, is under control and, and travel can resume, that I can come and visit you there. But it's a wonderful experience for me to get to, to know so many parts of this great big country uh, and meet the different people, uh, try the different foods from your different parts of the country and just experience your culture and learn more about your history. Uh, you know, I, I, that that's the most fun part of the job. The, you know, the part of the job that, that came as a biggest surprise to me was really the, the, the social media side. As, as you may know, 
Uh, I'm very active on Twitter. And if you don't follow me yet, you should. You can get me at arroba usambmex. Um, I uh, started, I didn't tweet in my old job in Washington. And I started tweeting when I arrived in Mexico. I went to um, the Basilica of the Virgin of Guadalupe when I arrived. And then that first weekend, I went out to Xochimilco to go on the Trajineras. And I got such a positive response when I posted that. Uh, I think you know people are interested to see what life is like for an ambassador and maybe to experience their own country through a foreigner's eyes. So that's been a part of my job that I have really enjoyed. And if any of you follow me, you may see that when people comment on my tweets, I, I read the comments or I try to read the comments when I have time. And I, um, you know, try to respond to comments. I think it's a great way for me to meet people, at least virtually, not just here in Mexico City at big embassy receptions, but to meet people all over the country. And so, you know, Mexicans have given me a very warm welcome. And as the rector said, I really do feel uh, in casa, aquí en México. And I wanna thank all of you for the way you have, have received me and my family. And just say again, what a pleasure it is for me to live here in Mexico among all of you. So with that, why don't I finish my presentation and then we can open it up to questions and answers. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. And maybe if you uh, let me ask you something for the for the Q and A uh, session. I'm not hearing anything though. That's a little bit alarming. I only can can you hear please, the. Let me let me. I can read you. the chat, but I'm not hearing anything. Let me let me write you. Um, you know what I'll do? I will I will leave the meeting and sign in again. Maybe that will be better because everything has been frozen now for about 10 or 15 minutes. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, we will wait okay. you for you. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the ambassador is uh, trying to reconnect himself. Uh, I think that uh, we, are, uh, very, we are aware about the importance of the, our relationship with U.S and uh, the opportunities that we can create if we work together. Uh, uh, we have uh, always had the support of the US uh, government. Uh, I think he is already back with us. Uh, you are, can you unmute yourself? Yeah, you are back. I'm back. Sorry about that. I don't know what happened. About halfway through my talk, all of a sudden the screen froze and you all could hear me, I guess, but I couldn't see or hear you. Uh, that, that's okay, no, no problem, uh, Ambassador. Uh, we hear you again, we see you again, we, we, we heard your thoughts. And uh, I want to thank you for, uh, for sharing that thoughts with us. I think that we, we are all aware that uh, if we can work together, if we have cooperation and collaboration, we can achieve some more goals than, 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 than the ones that we can achieve by our, ourselves. So, muchas gracias. Y yep. lo, esperamos, lo esperamos en Aguascalientes pronto para que también venga a conocer la UTR y a comer unos tacos de lechón. Por supuesto que sí. So, um, uh, about the <laughs> okay. questions. Gracias. Um, we have a lot of questions from social media and, and also from here. Uh, so uh, the people who is already connected in Zoom, if you can please uh, raise your hand and I will uh, give you the word if it's needed. And um, um, we can start from, uh, from people from social media. Uh, that uh, um, journalist from... Uh, Radio VI Aguascalientes asks us if there is any action that the embassy is taking in the education field in order to offer Mexican students more possibilities to have a mobility experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, this is a very important question right now. And let me say this, that one of the areas that uh, COVID has really affected is the uh, general operation of our embassy. I didn't mention this, but we went to a very reduced staff uh, back in March, uh, in, starting on Marvel in our offices. So as a result, we stopped offering all of our consular services except for emergencies. Uh, you know, if somebody had a family member who was dying or, you know, an American citizen in Mexico was in trouble uh, and, and we kept the agricultural workers uh, going because that was a very, that's a very important thing for, for, for the economy of both countries. But we suspended our student visas, and not just in Mexico, but around the whole world. And um, I, I am very, very eager to get the student visa program started again. Uh, in fact, I, I've been in communication constantly with my counterparts in Washington, at the State Department, at the Department of Homeland Security, at the White House, because it seems to me, uh, as I mentioned in my talk, that educational exchanges are among the best uh, way to uh, create that connective tissue between our countries that I talked about. Um, so frankly, my most important goal right now is getting visas for the students who are enrolled to study in the United States this fall and are attending educational institutions that have already decided that they're going back to in-person classes. Obviously, a lot of educational institutions in the United States are going to, just going to be doing online uh, courses this fall. Uh, you know, there's also a fair number that are going back to in-person classes. And so I am very uh, focused on restarting that program again. I don't have a date yet. So if any of your listeners or their friends uh, are worried about student visas, all I can say is that it's not within my power as ambassador to, to, to just start issuing them again. That, that decision has to come from Washington, but I'm very eager to get that process going again. You know, we just awarded uh, 81 um, ships back us to go and study in the United States and you know, I, I want to make sure that we, you know, can give visas to the people who are the becarios to complete their studies. Uh, so right now is just getting the uh, traditional programs that we have working again and getting the visas going. Uh, you know, I think I would like to uh, make it a priority of mine over my time here to increase these programs of um, uh, 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 study abroad uh, on both sides of the border. Uh, but, but right now, I'm, I'm mostly focused on trying to save what we already have rather than, than expanding it, just given the circumstances. Uh, that, that's the most challenging thing. I will say that Mexico is number 10 of countries that send students Uh, I think we are missing you again. Yeah, it's every year. Um, I think Chami? That for a few Can moments, you hear me? Possible, but uh, I think you're already uh, again. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Maybe I should turn off my video. If, this, if, the, if the connection is unstable, that may be taking up some of the bandwidth. Let me, so I, I've turned off my video. Uh, it's, it's, anyway, so I, you know, I, I, I hear you on the education front, and I will do what I can. Thank you. You're, you're, uh, you're welcome. Uh, talking about economics, uh, uh, there's a lot of questions about the um, the um, the meeting that probably President Trump and Lopez Obrador will be having on the next few weeks, and but uh, someone on social media asked us 
what are the biggest difference between NAFTA and the TEMEC? And in your opinion, it is, this is a better treaty or how it, how it will be contribute to the relationship between US, Mexico and Canada? Yeah, uh, th th that's a very good question. The, the you know, Tratado Libre de Comercio or NAFTA was about 25 years old uh, and it did not have uh, any protections, let's say, for workers' rights. Uh, so, you know, there, there was a big concern in the United States, particularly among unions and, and workers, that that was unfair, that, uh, you know, businesses could move a factory to Mexico and not have to comply with the same, you know, standards of protection for, for workers and the environment. Uh, you know, generally, there was an attempt to modernize the, 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 the free trade agreement to address loopholes in it to, um, you know, don't, don't forget it was it was created or signed at a time when the internet basically didn't even exist. Uh, and what we're doing now a zoom call, it, you know, it would have been impossible. So I think it was very important to you know, uh, renegotiate some of these provisions uh, and to modernize the agreement. I think at base, it's still the same idea that we want to create a, a, a North American uh, you know, common market for, 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 for goods and services. Uh, we strengthen the dispute resolution provisions there so that if somebody is not uh, abiding by the rules uh, of the treaty, there's now a mechanism for enforcement. So, you know, I think there was a lot of ways in which it brought the, the old treaty into the 21st uh, century. Uh, and, and, you know, again, I hope that that provides a, a solid basis for investment in North America, and in particular for bringing back to our three countries of North America, some of the supply chain that have left and gone off to China and other parts of the world. I think, you know, we have a lot of opportunities here and, and I hope we take advantage of them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, I have here uh, Jacqueline Rico, one of our teachers, asking for a uh, word. So Jacqueline, can you please unmute yourself and uh, do your question, please? Hi, thanks, Rector, for this opportunity, and hello to everyone. I just have one question. I, more than a question, it's more like uh, hearing about your opinion. How can we increase or improve like cultural understanding? Because that is one of our main like re uh, objectives as a bilingual institution. Mm -hmm. So it's not only like learning like the language or participating and like in different projects, but also like to get involved with culture. And now that you're saying that it's this relationship that we are growing or that we are having um, needs to be like well argumented. So I would like right. to listen to your opinion. Sure, well, thank you for that question. I think it's very important for people in both countries to visit the other country and really try to see beyond the stereotypes of both countries. Uh, you know, I think every country has a, a vision of what the other country, what another country is like. And, you know, I think for instance, I'd like to see more American tourists when they come to Mexico, not only go to the beach, you know, in Cancun or in, in Puerto Vallarta, but really come to Mexico City to see the Zocalo and see all the, the you know the, the the big buildings to see some of the uh, you know incredible industrial activities that go on in the Bajio let's say I mean there are uh, you know very impressive factories there you have some of the most sophisticated facilities in the world and I think it's very important for both countries to go beyond their stereotypes. Uh, I think, 
you know, also for Mexicans to really get out and, 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 and see, you know, different parts of the United States. Uh, I think it's great if you, you know, if people could do more um, educational exchanges, maybe doing a semester abroad at a university in the United States to just get that experience. Um, you know, you in Mexico probably know our culture better than we know yours, just because I see more American TV here and American movies. You know, I, I, I think it's great, you know, when I see Mexicans um, like Guillermo del Toro and Iñárritu, uh, you know, really um, making a mark on Hollywood. Uh, but, you know, then they're, they're really producing pretty American style movies too. I mean, I think um, it's, uh, you know, it's a challenge because you want Americans to understand that Mexico is not just big sombreros and, you know, uh, it, it is a very, very big and rich and varied country like our country is. I mean, both of our countries are among the biggest countries in the world with an incredible diversity of, of people. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think the best way to do that is really uh, just to, to, to get there and actually see the other country. So I, I hope we can do more of that. And I, I want to, again, congratulate you and, and everybody else involved with, with your university for, uh, you know, pursuing a bilingual education, which I think is, is, is so important. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. I have one question uh, as a rector. Uh, what, in your opinion, what would it be your advice for our young students? And what are the main characteristics that they must have in order to develop uh, or achieve a business uh, relationship with people in US or to have the possibility to uh, make an interchange about technology to develop a new project. Uh, in your opinion, what, what do you think about it? Well, I think it's very important in education, not just about an education in the abstract, but be very focused on what jobs are you looking to prepare your students for? And I think it's, you know, it's very, one of the things I've liked about Mexico, when I've gone around the country to different uh, places, let's say when I was in Villahermosa, I saw a lot of students who were focusing on petroleum engineering. When I was up on the border, let's say Nuevo Laredo, I saw a lot of students who were focusing kind of on business degrees, you know, that would prepare them to work in the maquila industry and, and that sector. Uh, you know, in, in Querétaro, I think they have aerospace, uh, you know, courses at the university. I think it is good, um, you know, for a university to understand that, you know, it's preparing people, students, not only with a, a general education, which of course we all, we all need to know the basics of a classic education, but skills. And, you know, I guess for, you know, my question back to you, Rector, would be, what kind of jobs do your students do TR? Because I think, you know, to understand the preparation, it's good to understand, so, you know, what, what is the sectors or, or tell me a little bit about what, you know, where your students, where your graduates wind up working. Well, uh, here at UTR, we have different programs. Uh, here, f first of all, in like uh, under, uh, uh, we have mechatronics fields, we have uh, IoT, we have uh, human capital development, we have marketing, we also have uh, uh, digital de de design in the animation field. And we also mm -hmm. prepare our students uh, to become uh, English teachers. So we Great. are um, we are um, collaborating with the uh, state government in order to become the first uh, bilingual state 
in, 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 in Mexico. That's great. I mean, one thing I would say is that I think it could be very useful if you tried to establish partnerships with particular American companies that do business in Mexico, you know, so that, um, you know, they would know, you know, that they would benefit from, you know, working with you, maybe giving like internships to your students to work with them, uh, maybe opportunities to go to their facilities in the United States and be trained. Um, you know, I, I would really encourage you to reach out to American companies uh, down here, of which there are many, and, you know, say, you know, we are a bilingual university, we, we would like to partner with you, and we think we're, you know, a good partner because, you know, we're producing graduates uh, who, you know, are, are going to be familiar with the language and the culture of the United States. And, and, you know, it will help you and help us to, you know, give them that experience. I mean, that's just one thought I had. Uh, but, but um, you know, again, I think, I think it's, you know, th these are very valuable skills now. I mean, particularly English is a language, not only of the United States, but really of the whole world in terms of, uh, you know, business and, it's, it's kind of become the, the common language of the world in the last, uh, you know, 50 or 75 years. So I think it's, it's, it's valuable to learn English. I mean, frankly, it's a problem in my country that I think so many people, uh, you know, are, feel like all they need is English. So there, you know, there aren't as many people in my country who speak a second language as, as I wish there were. Uh, but, but, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, certainly, you know, we would like as, as the U.S. government to increase our participation with you on different programs. I know that we have, you know, worked with you and, and um, we've had people from our student exchange programs come there and, and our international uh, visitor leadership programs have, have been exchanged there. So, you know, I hope we can uh, make those, those ties even deeper. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. I have here uh, Paola Cervantes, one of our students. Can you please unmute yourself, please, Paola? I see Paola. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi. Um, well, hello. Hello, I want to know um, if there is an opportunity for us to study <clears throat> over there in the States, maybe as a master degree or maybe being students of UTR because some of us are almost finishing. So I want to know what are our opportunities to can get an opportunity in the States. Right, well, I think you know, right now things are really a little bit tricky with the pandemic, as I was saying, you know, a lot of American uh, universities uh, and educational programs have suspended in-person classes in a few months. Uh, um, I, I would say I would encourage you to keep in touch with our consulate there uh, in Guadalajara, which is the, the close, which is the one that covers Aguascalientes. Um, Mr. Sundeep Paul, our, our uh, cultural uh, counselor there, I think is a very good uh, contact to uh, you know, learn about educational opportunities in the United States, uh, talking about, you know, Becas and other kinds of programs there are to study in the United States. So there are definitely opportunities out there. I just think for the next six months or so, at least, it's going to be complicated. Uh, and, and so I think, you know, the pandemic has, has made so many things uh, very difficult. Right now, you know, I'm not sure that we're going to have any student visas for the whole world. Uh, you know, I, I hope so. And I'm, I'm, I'm fighting for that. But we, we don't have any assurances as to when we'll even start issuing student visas again. 
So I am hoping that that will be very soon, but, but I can't give you a date yet. But, you know, again, I would, I would touch base with our, our consulate in Guadalajara and, you know, follow our embassy on, on uh, Twitter and, and Instagram, social media to see opportunities for different kinds of courses of study. I think there's a lot of American universities that are interested in having uh, Mexican students. It looks like the consul has raised her hand, so maybe she has something to add here. Let's see, Robin? Uh, I think you're- I got it, I just had a hard time unmuting. Buenos, buenos dias todos. Um, thank you, sir. Um, I think we want to keep the spotlight on you today, but we, uh, Sandeep and I, can follow up and provide a lot of information on the um, educational mobility and uh, educational opportunities that we can provide to all your students. Um, not only do we have usual programs, but uh, Sandeep and his team have been working hard to make them uh, work virtually. So we have proposed, we have asked for funding for a English um, fellows program in Aguascalientes, but virtually, and we're just waiting for the final decisions. And, um, and there are a lot of programs that we already did virtually. Sometimes we have high schools and colleges team up with schools in the United States and do, do exchanges um, uh, by meeting, by Zoom and other ways. Um, but there's a lot of movement in the last four months to try to see what we can keep doing to uh, make those programs occur. So um, we're gonna keep the spotlight on the ambassador today, but we promise to follow up and Sandeep is a uh, very good speaker on these subjects in all languages. So we'll, we will make sure we answer these questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mrs. Consul. Um, uh, next one I have here, uh, Belen Beltran. Uh, please, can you unmute yourself, please, Belen? Hi, everyone. Well, I have a more general question. Um, as we were seeing, it's always good to hear others' opinions because in that way we can like reach your knowledge. So according to your experience, which will be the most important advice that you could give to Mexican society? Ah, uh, you know, it's not really my role as an ambassador to give advice to Mexican society. I mean, you know, Mexican society is, is great. I mean, I, I have felt very welcomed here in Mexico. You know, I, I, um, I'm very, as I said before, I feel like the relations between our countries have really matured a lot over the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, and I think that's very healthy. Um, you know, I, 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 I think, uh, again, I would encourage Mexicans to, um, you know, really see the United States as a, as a, uh, a friend and a neighbor and, and uh, you know, a country that, uh, you know, needs Mexico to succeed. And I think Mexico needs the United States to succeed. I, I think that's just a very healthy way of, of um, moving forward. I know, you know, our countries historically have had our differences and I, I respect that. I'm a student of history and you can't, you can't deny uh, history. But I also think, you know, we're, we're always be neighbors. I mean, the, 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 nothing will change that. And, you know, I think we can either be neighbors who uh, are good partners or neighbors that, you know, don't get along. And, you know, certainly the reason that I'm here in Mexico is because I want to make sure that we are, you know, neighbors who, who get along and, you know, respect each other, respect our differences, try to find common ground, uh, and try to find many solutions that, uh, you know, work, are, are, you know, ganar ganar for people on both sides of the border. I think it's a problem whenever we, you know, you, you say, well, this is good for me, and then it's bad for you. I think that's kind of what I feel the most important thing in my job is to try to look at any problem and say, well, is there a solution I can come up with here that 
doesn't mean one country wins and one country loses. It's a, it's a, it's a solution that allows both countries to win because ultimately I think, you know, that's the only way in which we're going to have a solid and healthy relationship. And again, I think it's, it's so important to both our people. And again, I think, you know, the, the, the relationship is really in the hands of people like you, uh, who, you know, have made it a point to study at a bilingual university and are able to converse in English uh, as well as in Spanish. And, you know, I think, you know, with more people like you, I, I, I have more optimism about the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, you remind me uh, uh, a thought from uh, Desmond Tutu, the Nobel Peace Prize. He said mm -hmm. that, do, you little, do your little bit of good where you are. And if those little bits of good put together that overwhelm the world, it, that, that is an engaging collaboration and cooperation. And I, I think that that is, that is a great uh, way to, to, to achieve common, common good for everybody. Um, right. I have, I have here uh, Professor Christian Eduardo Guerrero, and after that, if you allow me, I will do it. Uh, I will do it another question for you, Professor. Hi, my name is Christian from Language Department, and uh, uh, my my question is: um, Will some uh, economic sectors uh, be excluded from? Um, from the uh, free agreement. Now that we're facing uh, a pandemic from COVID-19. I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't quite, I didn't quite hear the question. Oh, let me, let me. Can you make it? Can you please write it? Uh, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, Meanwhile, Ambassador, I want to do a question in Spanish. Uh, sure. ¿Cuál ha sido su, su mejor experiencia en México fuera de la oficina del embajador? ¿Y cuál es su comida favorita, su, su, su plato ah, okay. mexicano? Bueno, to todas mis experiencias favoritas de México han estado fuera de la oficina del embajador. <risa> um, pero, pero no, realmente mis, mis experiencias favoritas han sido los viajes al interior. Uh, yo conocí a México de turista ya desde los 17 años. Estuve en Puerto Vallarta una vez allá en, por el 81. Uh, y, um, pero yo creo que tendría que decir que mi mejor experiencia ha sido toda la celebración del Día de Muertos en el mes de octubre, que aquí en México, bueno, ya comenzando cuando plantaron los cempasúchil aquí, es algo que no existe en mi país y, y me fascinó todo lo que tiene que ver con, con esta, este día. Después, para, para conmemorar el Día de Muertos, me fui con mi familia a Michoacán, a la zona lacustre de de, de Pátzcuaro y realmente ahí nos fuimos a, 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 al cementerio, por, uh, al panteón um, por la noche y es algo, otra vez, como es una maravilla ver eso, ver a la gente ahí uh, rendiendo homenaje a sus antepasados y para mí eso ha sido sin duda una experiencia, fue una experiencia muy mágica para mí y, y algo inolvidable porque no, no existe en ninguna otra parte del mundo. Uh, en cuanto a la comida, uh, bueno, cada región tiene su comida favorita, pero realmente no conocía el taco al pastor, así que eso sí que lo he comido muy bien aquí en Ciudad de México. No les quiero ofender allá en Aguascalientes porque no conozco Uh, sus especialidades allá. Uh, uh, eh, eh, se, se, se comí muy buena carne en, en Hermosillo, en Sonora, y uh, las chalupas de Puebla también han sido para mí una revelación. Pero espero ver cuál es la especialidad de aguas calientes. Yo podría decir que es el taco de lechón. De Ay, lechón, ok. Es, ok. Es, es, mm. Pues ya se me antoja y que me lo tengan ya listo para mi, con mi visita, ¿ok? 
estoy seguro que además le va a encantar. Además, otra de okay. las ventajas de Aguascalientes es que tenemos los atardeceres más bonitos del ah, interior. Ah, qué lindo. Ok. Sin lugar a dudas. A ver si ya tenemos la otra pregunta. Sí. Uh, um, el profesor uh, dice, Will, um, ¿Will some economic sectors be excluded from the free trade agreement? Yeah, you know, uh, the, the, the agreement doesn't cover everything. I mean, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's, you know, total uh, free trade. Um, you know, there, there's some special uh, provisions, but, you know, that, that's the goal that, it, that, that, that um, you know, it covers even things like agriculture, Uh, but, you know, we, we still have, you know, we have problems. We, we want to export our potatoes to Mexico. Mexico wants to export the avocados from Jalisco. You know, there, there are, you know, the, it, it, the free trade agreement doesn't mean that every single uh, industry has complete and, and open access. I mean, that's the goal. Uh, but, um, you know, we're, we're always working towards that goal. Uh, but, but, you know, I think in general, uh, it's a very good place to start uh, to, or, you know, it's, it, we've been building on this now for, for 30 years. And I think the most important, or, you know, one of the things that I think people don't realize is when you buy an automobile now, you can't really say it's just made in Mexico or made in the United States. It, it contains components from many different countries. And, you know, that the, the components of that car may have passed the border eight or 10 times uh, in the life of that car. So at some point it becomes almost impossible to say, you know, that car was made in Mexico or that car was made in the United States because it's really, it's really both sides of the border. And, you know, w w w the thing that I'm, I'm most focused on now is just, you know, making sure for these kinds of industries that are cross border industries that we, Uh, you know, keep the, the um, rules of the road or, the, you know, we, 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 we keep these possibilities open. Uh, and it was very difficult during the pandemic. Um, but there certainly are some provisions of the treaty that, you know, recognize certain industries as having special rules like the energy sector in Mexico. I mean, you know, again, that there are some kind of very special uh, sectors uh, and, Uh, but, 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 you know, the, the idea is certainly to try to open up our economies to each other. Thank you. Thank you. If you allow us a final question and after that, we can uh, move to a final reflection. We have Juan sure. Antonio Ortega uh, here. Uh, can you please unmute yourself, please, Juan Antonio? Go ahead, Juan Antonio. We cannot hear you. Are you there, Juan Antonio? I think we lost him. Well, uh, Ambassador, can you please share with us a, like a final reflection? Uh, because we we know that we are uh, trying to prepare our students for the future, and uh, like the former president of the United States said, if your actions inspire others to dream more, to learn more, to do more, and become more, you became a leader. That that was uh, that that was that uh, John Quincy Adams said. So can you please share to us? to our students, a final reflection about uh, the importance of betting a future, the importance of preparing themselves, and the and how can all together can build a, a better world. Yeah, I, you know, I would say when you are, a, a, you know, as you grow up, you go through different phases in life. And when you're a teenager, I have a daughter who is 13. And I thought that was maybe the worst time of my whole life at that age. And everybody says, oh, when you're a kid, that's a great time. And, you know, you 
you should enjoy your childhood, but I was miserable. And, you know, I had, uh, as I think I mentioned, I had grown up in Asuncion uh, and went to a bilingual school. And then my parents sent me off to a boarding school, Internado, in, in Massachusetts, a very small school, a very provincial school where they had never seen anybody from South America or Latin America, much less Paraguay. And, um, you know, that was the most difficult time of my life. And I felt like what I wanted to do then was just to fit in with everybody else and be the same as everybody else. And that was very difficult for me because I didn't have the same cultural background. I hadn't seen the same television shows and the same movies or listened to the same music. <laughs> and, you know, um, so, uh, you know, I was very unhappy in those years. I, I later realized that being successful in life is actually showing what makes you different than other people and having your own brand. And, you know, I really embraced what was special about me that made me different from everybody else around me. And I want to just congratulate, you know, the students here today and, and, the, and the faculty as well for making it possible for yourselves and for your students to have something that gives them a very special skill that makes them very different, that they will have, uh, you know, receive their education in a bi binational and bilingual setting. And I think, you know, I, I encourage you as you move forward into your life to figure out, you know, what is your story? What makes you special that makes you different than fulanito down there or fulana over there, you know, like, you know, embrace what, what, uh, what is really your special gift and don't just try to, to blend in, but actually be proud of, of what makes you who you are. And, and, uh, you know, know that if somebody asks you, well, you know, why should I hire you for the job? You know, ha have an answer to that. Like, you know, know what, understand, you know, what is it that, 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 that you are selling? You have to sell yourself. And, you know, I think you have something very special and I hope you appreciate the, the opportunity that UTR is giving you. And uh, again, I, I am very honored to have had this chance to be with you today. I wish you the best and um, let's keep in touch. I hope to see you in Aguas Calientes very soon. Gracias. Gracias, embajador. Eh, pues para nosotros ha sido un honor tenerlo con nosotros. Seguramente lo veremos pronto por acá con el equipo del consulado. Le tendremos ya preparados sus tacos de lechón para que los disfrute. Oh, oh. Sí, seguro, seguro. Okay. Y, este, y pues resulta muy importante para nosotros, para los alumnos, para los profesores, tener este tipo de oportunidades. También le agradezco, señor embajador, esa apertura que ha tenido no solo con nosotros, sino con el país en general. Eh, se agradece realmente tener eh, la oportunidad de, 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 de tener pláticas, de estar cerca, de sentir que tenemos más cosas en común que sí. las diferencias. De ¿Cómo que, no? Absolutamente. De que si trabajamos juntos podemos lograr mejores cosas, de que si, como dice usted, apostamos por lo mejor de nosotros, reconociendo lo mejor de los demás, seguro llegaremos a un mucho mejor final y alcanzaremos eh, muchos más eh, objetivos juntos. Le agradezco la oportunidad, embajador. A todos los que nos vieron durante este ciclo de conferencias, durante mayo y junio, tuvimos 16 excelentes conferencistas. Hoy cerramos con broche de oro con The Honorable Christopher Landau, <risa> y eh, Gracias. a todos los jóvenes estudiantes recuerden stay safe and proudly UTR see you the next one thank you Mr. Ambassador bye bye bye